All right, I think we're ready to go. So, uh, project risk analysis. Um, this is a, a, a short, uh, 40 minutes or talk about project risk analysis and maybe why you should consider using it or things that you might be able to do a bit better if you are already using it. Uh, first question, why do we do project risk analysis? Uh, and the, the basic reason is, to start with, is we want better estimates. The very first reason, we want better estimates of the cost and duration of our project. So um, a few alarming statistics uh, about reviews of projects that have been done over the years. Over 12% of investment is lost by poor project performance. Um, one in six IT projects has a cost overrun of 200% plus, delays of 70 plus, percent plus, and 18% fail completely. Oil and gas mega projects average budget overrun 59%, etc. And KPMG uh, did a survey a few years ago looking at the main reasons for project failure. In other words, the ability to meet the deadline, the ability to stay under budget, the ability to deliver the product that everybody is hoping for. And the seven key factors in here are design change, which is a risk, something, risk of something new happening. Poor original cost estimates, and that's something we can very much address with project risk analysis because inevitably there is a bias, which I will explain a little bit. Uh, location and connectivity of the site, and this relates very strongly to productivity. If it's an awkward site, you can imagine this uh, building up here. Um, it's difficult to get materials there, different, difficult to get personnel there, perhaps um, heavy machinery. Um, so these can affect productivity. And perhaps we don't include the uncertainty about those probability rates in our schedule. Material price escalation, which is a cost issue. Then on the second column, we've got access to skilled resources. Again, that becomes a productivity issue. Uh, poor technology, again, part of that, certainly productivity, and poor equipment. So there's a lot around productivity. And as I will argue uh, in a few minutes, Failing to account for productivity can be uh, can give you a very poor estimate of the risks of your project. Right, so let's start off with a little simple distribution. This is a probability distribution on the horizontal axis is uh, time or cost. On the vertical axis is some measure of relative likelihood or probability. And we have a probability distribution described by this blue line. So it says that this value can lie anywhere between the minimum, where my mouse is now, and the maximum, somewhere over here. And it has a most likely value, which is drawn by the dotted red line. That most likely value peaks here, which shows you the, the value that we think is most probable to occur. And in a project schedule, it is quite natural, and a cost estimate as well, it's quite natural to put in these values, these mode values, into your schedule. So you think, well, what's the most likely amount of time it's going to take to complete this task, and how much is it most likely going to cost, etc. So we enter these numbers. But the problem with those numbers is that given that we're trying to always to achieve a project in the shortest time and with the shortest price, we, we are pushing the limits. We, we're trying to figure out already ways that we can do it cheaper, we can do it faster. And that means that there aren't many things that can happen that will make that duration or that cost get much smaller than we're already planning for. So it's not much chance of it the value going below the mode, our best guess. But there are an awful lot of things that can go wrong. And when they go wrong, they increase the time and they increase the cost invariably. Otherwise, they'd be good things and we would have planned for them in the first place. So what that means is in this probability distribution, which has a peak at the mode, has a longer tail to the right. In other words, the distance from the mode to the maximum is much greater than the distance from the mode 
to the minimum. And this means, through uh, a bit of pure statistics, that the P50, which is your 50, 50 value, the value you have 50% chance of being above or below, the P50 always sits above the mode. In other words, if you can see this area here, colored out below the P50, that's your 50% chance of being below the P50. That's a 50% chance of being above the P50. And that means you have a less than 50% chance of coming under the mode. So if you put in your best guess estimate in the task duration or task cost within a schedule, you have less than 50% chance of achieving that, coming underneath. Therefore, you have a greater than 50% chance of being more. And it turns out that there is another statistic about the central tendency of this distribution called the mean. The mean is the average of all of these different values weighted by their probabilities. You can also think of the mean as a balance point of this distribution. If I was to cut it out of my screen here, and put my finger underneath, it would balance at this point where the triangle is, it's like a fulcrum, which uh, I use a fulcrum to describe means to try and reiterate that idea. Now the mean is a value that turns out to be quite useful in costs, because if you take the mean value of the distribution of one cost and add it to the mean value of the distribution of another cost, et cetera, et cetera, that all ends up adding up to the mean value of the total cost. It isn't the case for durations, but it is for total cost. So that, so that can be kind of a useful statistic. In other words, if you're going to go for one single point estimate from this distribution, it would be the mean. The rub is that in order to be able to figure out the mean, you need to have the distribution in the first place, not just the mode. Baseline plans uh, also underestimate for several other reasons, and I'll just run through them now. So if you can see in, in this very simple schedule, we've got tasks A to D, and the critical path lies through task A, then through task B, and then finally through task D to give us our milestone at the end of the finish. But if you assign probability distributions, in other words, you describe these as being uncertain, there will be some random variation in how long it's going to take to finish task A, and therefore the starts, uh, starts of tasks B and C. And similarly, it will be a random variation in how long tasks B and C will take to finish. Sometimes it will be task B, perhaps most often, it will be task B that finishes last, hence task D will start because of the finished task B, but sometimes it can also be, if there's uncertainty about both of these, that task C will drive the start date of task D. So it turns out that we cannot, uh, we cannot just look at the critical path and assign distributions to uncertain tasks in the critical path. We must do it for others outside of the critical path because the critical path will run through A and then the maximum of B and C and then D. So even if we were to actually use the mean distribution or the mean values of the distributions for each of these tasks to kind of build up our, our baseline schedule, we would actually still underestimate the, the total duration. Right? We wouldn't have the midpoint of the total duration. There's another reason for underestimation, and that's um, something that's often called correlation. A correlation is the, uh, when two or more tasks take longer or shorter durations to, uh, to complete in concert with each other. So there is, a, there is a pattern. If one task takes longer, another one will take longer. If one takes shorter time, another take shorter time. Sometimes, occasionally, it's the reverse, but often they go in concert. Now, correlations um, uh, have often traditionally been thought of as uh, modeled with uh, little statistical tools called copulas. And here at the bottom of the screen, you will see some examples of copulas. These are scatter plots. They're showing certain patterns between one variable and another. So in this case, this variable, in the third one, when one variable takes a very slow, small value, the other one is extremely likely to take a small value. 
when one variable takes a high value, the other variable is quite likely to take a high variable. And you have these different patterns. Excuse me. So, but why does correlation occur? Um, and that's something that we, we looked at a great deal in, uh, in our investigation of project risk analysis. And if you remember a, a couple of slides ago with the KPNG study, I was talking about how many of the things that were driving the failure of a project were to do with productivity. So productivity is something that can impact many tasks. If, for example, you have extremely poor weather over a long period, then all of the tasks that are affected by weather that are being done during that period can take longer or they can take short amount of time if uh, the weather's very good. So they, they're going up and down because of these causal factors. And in our view, this is a way that one should attempt to model the correlation structure between cost and time in within a project. There's another reason a final reason why baseline plans tend to underestimate and therefore why we tend to get disappointed in the final outcome of our project and that's because of risk. So uh, most risks that we think of are low probabilities. There are occasionally you can think of a very high probability risk um, which is you might as well put it in your schedule and just have a, an opportunity that that risk does not occur if you like. So it's, it's the same so different sides of the same coin. But most of the time, we're dealing with fairly low probability risk events. So uh, an event that may or may not happen. And if it does happen, it can, for example, increase the scope of a task. So you might need to build a, a bigger thing or a longer thing or add extra, uh, extra lampposts to the street or whatever. Um, we can also have risks um, that can decrease the, or increase if we're lucky, but decrease the performance level of the resources we're using. Like if we're expecting to use a very uh, powerful, fast digger, and it turns out the one that we can get is a mediocre, slow digger, or the driver is operator is not very good, then we can have a re reduced performance. Another uh, type of risk is one where we required extra work to be done that has not been planned for. If it's not planned for, it's not going to be in your schedule, of course. And so with this, there's always going to be a bias towards a, a baseline schedule that does not have unplanned work in it because it's not planned. And another type of risk, which uh, <clears throat> I think is a very interesting one, is where you, you have a shutdown of a, a part of the project or a site. So for example, you might have it that you're, you're using a contractor to do all the design work, the contractor goes bust, or all design work just gets halted until you've managed to get a new designer on the job. It could be that there's a hurricane on, on site and you have to s shut the site down or you know, any other natural disaster. Uh, could be that there is an accident and health and safety come along and they shut down your site until they've done an evaluation. You get the idea. The thing is, if you have a large enough project, you will have a lot of risks. And with a lot of risks, even if some of them, if most of them are low probability, you can be pretty much guaranteed that some of them are going to happen. And that will mean that your project will take longer than you plan for. Right, um, so a quick look at project risk analysis process. Um, I don't really spend too much, mind, uh, too much time on process. We all have our, our, our different methods, but I thought I'd give you just a couple of notes on things you should think about. Uh, so first thing is brainstorming, and uh, it doesn't have to be, or it shouldn't be really, just one single brainstorm, but uh, perhaps a series of brainstorming sessions where you're deliberately looking at potential risks or uncertainties that might impact your project. It's a good idea to have a separate activity for doing this so people are really focusing on the risks. 
that's the job. The job is to leave, be a little bit negative, if you like. Some people think of it as negative, but be a little bit negative. Go, what well, could go wrong? Actually, deliberately ask yourself and write it down. Uh, so we're looking for risk events that could increase the task duration or the cost. We're looking for reasons why there might be some uncertainty for the scope, uh, why the productivity could be uncertain or something that could happen that could dramatically affect the productivity. Uh, what might induce us to produce extra work? Uh, what risk events um, could happen, happen that would shut down a location? Those things that I was talking about in the previous slides. And when you've considered all of those, you need to put numbers around them. And by numbers, I mean you need to estimate, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but you need to estimate the probability of these events occurring or the frequency because sometimes you have events that can occur multiple times like a strike if you once you've had a strike you can't say oh there will never be another strike because it's already happened it could be that there were two or three strikes or two or three storms or or tornadoes or whatever so you have to assign some probabilistic number to the risk event and then you also have to assign some values for the range of impacts that this might have on your project. So ideally, you would consider a task for which uh, this would have the greatest impact and say, how much extra time is it going to take uh, to complete that task? And, and normally, we would look at a three-point estimate, so a minimum, a most likely, and then mm, a maximum. The maximum is one of those difficult things to estimate because a maximum just can just be almost infinite, you know? This project might not get finished before I retire sort of thing. Uh, so you, it's a, a difficult question to ask and what we prefer to do and certainly is written into our software is to ask for people for the P90. The, the means there's a 90% chance that the delay would be less than a certain amount. This is an easier, one in 10 chance. This is an easier thing to ask than a pure maximum. Then after you've come up with this list of risk and inevitably once you've had one brainstorming session, it will stimulate people to think a little bit more and another brainstorming session will probably come along and certainly as you evolve your project, you get into more detail, um, you, will, you will have more ideas of what might happen. And projects evolve and scope and changes. So it's a good idea to do this in, on a fairly continuous basis. I say this for, I think you should do this risk analysis and the whole scheduling process really from the very inception of your project. One of the key issues that comes out in, in project management is that you have a base estimate of how much the project's gonna cost, how long it's gonna take, it gets signed off by management, then it gets developed a bit further, people do a risk analysis, and then go back to management and say, actually, you're gonna to have to add 30% to that cost and it's gonna take 20% longer. People have already signed off on one set of numbers. They don't like to see a new set of numbers. So it's a good idea to train them that things are uncertain from the very beginning. So I'm a strong advocate for, at the very, beginning the conceptual um, part of your project, you start doing risk analysis, broad and vague as it might be. It trains decision makers into thinking that these things are uncertain. We cannot, we cannot uh, rely on, on a set number yet. Okay, so going back, we have the brainstorming. And then afterwards, you'll need to revise your schedule, the base schedule model, Primavera or MS project. Um, so it will be compatible with simulation. In order to be able to quantify the effects of, uh, of uncertainty on risk on a schedule, we need to run a simulation on a schedule. So we've got a, a project plan. We're going to add some uncertainty into it, and I'll show this in a minute. So things that are incompatible um, with a project risk analysis simulation is hard constraints. You can't have hard constraints saying, for example, this this task must be finished by the 1st of July, 2020. If 
we want to look at the risks that it might not finish by the 1st of July 2020. Um, it might be built into the schedule that all efforts will be made to complete it by time, that time, but the risk analysis is designed not to be a crystal ball. So we're saying we do not know. Let's see what the uncertainties would do in terms of jeopardizing our, our achievements of these goals. You shouldn't have any orphans. Orphans are tasks that don't have any predecessors or um, are not connected to other tasks, basically, because um, they don't really, they just flap around and don't do anything. If you've got an, a task on your, your schedule that isn't connected to others, I'm sure that something it must be connected to it in the end, even if it's just uh, the end milestone. Otherwise, why is it in your schedule? We also would need to add zero duration tasks for the potential extra work. So we'll, we'll explore that in a minute. But the idea behind that is that if you have one schedule and it's possible that you may, you may, do, may need to do some extra work, you want to know where that extra work would occur, perhaps who's going to be doing it, and what is going, what other tasks is, are going to depend on it. So that means that we should really have the scheduler figure out where those extra tasks would fit in the schedule, and then we follow along and model that it might not be a zero duration. So I think I believe in getting the scheduler to put those that extra work in the schedule, and then we simulate that it's, it could be non-zero. At the same time, one should avoid negative legs. Um, they just don't make any sense. You know, task uh, task X will start three weeks before task Y finishes. Well, that in a deterministic world, you know, we can get our crystal ball out and go, oh, it's task Y is going to finish in three weeks. Let's start now. But in reality, that doesn't happen. In reality, if we're going to acknowledge that risks can occur and there could be uncertainty, then it doesn't really make sense that we uh, we base a schedule on predicting perfectly into the future when another task um, will finish. The better the, the reason why we normally have lags is because it, they're a surrogate for breaking down the predecessing task into smaller components. Um, so it is better just to break down that task into smaller parts and then make sure, if we can, to have a finished start logic all through the model. We shouldn't build from links from summary tasks, and the reason for that is that a summary task isn't really a task. It's much more logical to build from something that really happens. Um, we should also not have long lags, um, and we should, uh, should not have long task durations, because what happens with long lags and long task durations is you put uncertainty around them. They tend to dominate the uncertainty about the project as a whole. And we should really think about you know, uh, if splitting these things up. After we've revised our schedule, we can then turn to risk analysis software and we can start running a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, adding the uncertainties into the schedule, running the simulation, and then re review the results uh, and revise our estimates and more. We want to look into the drivers that are causing our project to be uncertain and start asking ourselves, well, is there something we can do about that? Uh, just to uh, reiterate the idea about um, uh, extra work, here we've got uh, a schedule where you've got two tasks have zero days duration, um, but they're in the schedule with a particular logic so at the, in this random sample, they're switched off. They didn't happen. In another random sample, they've been switched on. And so you can see these now pink uh, are affecting the schedule, whereas they weren't before. And just a, a little explanation about this idea of uh, disruption risks. We use risks that can have an impact on all of the tasks within a particular uh, type of work or a particular uh, uh, site. So here we've got a, a schedule where the disruption risk has not occurred. And then here we've got say a shut site shutdown and all these tasks have been, have been dragged off to all, all shifted off into the future. Of course, with um, a site shutdown, you can still have 
costs associated with it. So you can have lots of costs with, for example, the security of the site. You might still have to pay for that or hiring of the equipment. So this doesn't mean that it's purely a, uh, a risk of delay. It can also have a risk of cost. And the logic of the software needs to take that into account. Um, finally, um, before I go into showing you some project risk analysis software and modeling, a little uh, uh, discussion about correlation, which I mentioned before. So um, typically, uh, in what I consider, we consider to be old school, the use of correlation coefficients. These are values between minus one and plus one, typically positive, typically between zero and one. Zero means there's no relationship between two tasks in terms of the, how long they will take. Um, no correlation. One is there is 100% correlation, which would mean that if one task was at the 90th percentile of its distribution, the other one would also be at the 90th percentile of its distribution. Uh, and there are a number of issues with this. One, the first issue is that if you've got correlation of, say, 25%, that doesn't look, and that's a correlation coefficient of 0.25, that doesn't look like much of an effect. And only when you get to about 0.5 does it look like there is some some relationship. In other words, it's rather difficult to intuitively come up with a number that makes sense, what that correlation number should look like. Second problem is that we need a matrix of coefficients. So when you've got a, uh, all these different tasks, say eight tasks here, um, then there is a, a, a relationship between, in terms of correlation coefficients, between each paired uh, set. So we've got task six get with task three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in here and in, in white in the grid, these are all correlation coefficients. The diagonal is one, this off off diagonal, because of course every task is 100% correlated with itself. The top half is blank because if if task two is correlated with task one of 0.3, then the inverse is also 0.3. So we only need to, in fact, put in a little less than half of the, the pairs um, that you, you were seeing there in terms of numbers. But that no, those numbers quickly escalate. So you can see here, uh, I made a little chart showing you as the number of correlated tasks increases, so the number of correlation coefficients that we need to uh, put in gets higher and higher. And this exponentially grows. So even at eight, just eight tasks, we need to have some 25, 27, 28, I think, 28 different correlation coefficients. So first of all, we don't know what on earth a correlation coefficient really means. Secondly, we've got to put a whole bunch of them in there, 28 for even an eight task project. So we go to a 100 task project, you're looking at something like 5,000 correlation coefficients you're not going to do it. And even if you did do it, these correlation coefficients must conform to a particular rule. Uh, this is a matrix and it must be something called positive semi-definite, which means that uh, if you do some eigenvalue calculations and most of you are probably not familiar with what they are, almost nobody is familiar with what they are, uh, do some eigenvalue uh, uh, calculations, there must be, um, a certain constraint. They must fall within a certain set of numbers. And this means that when we, we cannot really easily put high levels of correlation because anywhere we put a high level of correlation, it, it creates a pattern, it creates a, a lack of flexibility el elsewhere. And so we end up violating this rule about correlation coefficients and we just don't know how to fix it. If you can imagine, um, if I was to try and do this, and I'm pretty familiar with these things, at high levels of correlation, I would have serious problems with eight tasks. I doubt whether anybody can ever do it with 100 tasks or more. So put it all together, and um, codependency, this uh, is, is a very real issue, and we, we absolutely need to do it, but correlation coefficients, in, in our view, are really not the way. And I, I've noted uh, amongst my professional uh, colleagues in, in risk analysis that they just don't use the correlations um, because it's not practical. And that's a great shame because if there's one thing worse than uh, not doing a risk analysis, it's doing a risk analysis badly so that 
we were as a strong belief that there's no chance that the project can take more than two years, three months to complete. Whereas if we'd done correlation, we would have said, oh, actually, it's quite a good chance. Um, it's better perhaps not even to have done risk analysis at all and at least know that you've no idea rather than believe that you've got a strong uh, understanding of the exposure you face. So there are, the factor method of correlation um, is what we use. Uh, so you have a number of different factors. Uh, these are productivity risk factors, we call them. And uh, they are combined in certain ways into something called a work type category. Um, so productivity risk factor could be, for example, the rate at which a digger is able to dig out earth. And that rather depends on the structure of the earth and if it's extremely stony or if it's rocky or whatever. Another one could be the, the labor force, whether they're extremely competent or well-led, et cetera. So you've got these different factors. And a work type category would be, uh, for example, earthworks. If you're doing earthworks, you would have a certain combination um, with a, a ratio of these different factors, which would be different for, from architectural design. The, you, you're not driven at all by the rate at which a digger will dig up earth when you're designing the, the structure of the building. If we, we take these work type categories, we combine it with the scope uncertainty for the task. So if you put in, a, um, say, 30 days for a particular task, we ask the question, how sure, from the perspective of scope, how sure it's is it that it's going to be 30 days? Is it, could the scope be, say, 10% less, 20% more, whatever? You add that uncertainty in here, and you combine the two together, and you get an uncertainty about the duration of a task. So we have probability distributions for these productivity risk factors. We have probability distribution for the scope uncertainty, and the combination of them will give us the task duration uncertainty. Now, why this is really useful is because some of those same productivity risk factors, for example, the weather, can impact on different types of uh, work type categories. So say foundations would be strongly impacted by the weather when you're digging foundations, and this is why I put in a, a thicker line. Um, constructing walls on a building, less so. Fixtures and fittings, even less so. Uh, the roofing, again, strongly correlated, perhaps, or strongly affected, perhaps a little less than foundations. So this weather, if we happen to be lucky and we have very good weather, then we will do things faster, um, but at different rates. So we'll, we'll, the foundations will be done much faster, than expected, the roofing will be done somewhat faster, walls a bit faster, fittings almost not changed, and vice versa. So we have extremely bad weather, then these will all take longer within you know, the duration of the project. And so under each of these work type categories, we have different tasks. So there are different tasks associated with building the walls, boom, boom, boom. Each one of those will take longer or shorter, driven by that weather factor. But there are several different factors in a work type category. So there is a matrix of relationships. So for example, in foundations, the digger is also involved, but the digger is not involved in walls or fittings or roofing. Um, maybe you have the site management or the accessibility. So accessibility could have uh, strong implications for um, getting the roofing material there, um, for getting the, the walls there, and for the plant for the foundations. So another factor that would impact in a different degree, in a different pattern, on all these different tasks. If we put these together, we have achieved correlation in the durations of these tasks. We've achieved it in a way that makes sense. It's not a, a statistical modeling way, it's a way where you can start to say, what is actually driving the uncertainty and how quickly we're gonna achieve our tasks? So um, I'm going to show you now our tomorrow risk analysis software um, and where this is applied. So we have, we, we talk about the, the level of scope uncertainty. This goes into one particular column in the table of tomorrow. We talk about work type categories that goes into another particular column. 
we have productivity risk factors which are combined in different uh, in a matrix with different degrees um, into these work type categories and when these variables here have are driven with uncertainty they combine to produce different levels of uncertainty here which are logged and for all of the uh, all of the uh, tasks that share the same work type category they will take a longer or shorter simulated amount of time to complete. Uh, one quick pitch. Um, so there's, there's some commercial value to, to the webinar. Uh, I just want to make you aware that Tamara sits in a system of risk, quantitative risk analysis software tools that we, we produce. So we have um, Primavera and P6, oh, sorry, MS Project and, and Primavera uh, schedules can be imported into Tamara. We have a Pelican uh, enterprise risk management system. This is stores all sorts of information about risk and quantifies and does analyses. It's got dashboards and um, not PA t PI tables, but something looks similar. Um, it has bow tie analyses, all sorts of different things. Pelican is where you can store all the information about big risks, for example, a contractor that goes bust. And that information is stored in a couple of different ways. One of those ways is used by Tamara for direct simulation. So Tamara can take those results from the Pelican risk database, incorporate them into the Tamara schedule. And so if the information is updated from Pelican, it can be automatically updated in the Tamara schedule. And then it feeds back the results into Pelican because Pelican will look at a, uh, say a task or a, a delay that could be caused by a risk event. That delay might be <clears throat> a delay of say four weeks. For one project, because of where it appears on the, the schedule, on the, it's not on the critical path, it has almost no impact on the project. For another one, it might produce precisely four weeks of delay. So Pelican takes the information back from Tamara and displays uh, what the actual impact would be from say uh, a common risk like the risk of uh, a contractor going bust. In that contractor might be used in several projects. And you can see that the effect on one project is a day, on another one's four weeks, another one's two weeks, etc. And then rolls it all up and figures out how important that is at a project level, at a, uh, a business unit level, at a corporate level, etc. Um, we also have customer databases can be connected into Tamara, so you can use external risk registers in, in Tamara. You can also use external risk registers uh, or data in Pelican. Um, and you can use it in model risk. Model risk is the next uh, uh, webinar I'm giving in, in another 20 minutes. Uh, this is a, a spreadsheet risk analysis software, but you can also see that Tamara results, which I will show you in the next webinar if you're attending, the Tamara results can be fed into model risk. And again, model risk can pick information from Pelican and can deliver information back into Pelican. Uh, Okay, so model risk, uh, was, sorry, Tamara. Um, Tamara is a pretty big uh, piece of software. It can handle some 40,000 plus tasks. It's the biggest um, um, real schedule we've ever seen. Um, it can be used with the project's master schedule. So uh, a dilemma that's always been out there is do we have one schedule for risk analysis and another schedule for actual planning? And that seems to us uh, not only a waste of time, because you're constantly having to update the, the risk analysis schedule to reflect changes in the project schedule. But it also seems dangerous to us because you can make mistakes, um, it's inconsistent. And when you're, when you're trying to produce a, a risk analysis schedule that is a very much simplified version of the real schedule, you have to make an awful lot of compromises. And with those compromises, you will end up having a far less precise or uh, 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 informative risk analysis. So we built uh, Tamara on the basis that one should be able to do a risk analysis on an entire schedule. It can import from Primavera P3, P6 or MS Project. 
Um, and it can, once you've imported it and you've added some uh, risks and some uncertainties, you can click on the update and select the file. It will update from the latest version of that same schedule. So you don't have to, every time the schedule, the, main, the master schedule is changed, you don't have to redo your, your, uh, your risk analysis information. Uh, you can just update. It's also the world's fastest simulation. Um, with 5,000 samples, a 500 task uh, schedule takes about two and a half seconds, depending on your PC, you'll see that in a minute. Uh, correlation, as I said, we made it simple. And we've tried to focus on, a lot on being able to describe risks and uncertainties in a lot of different ways, because we recognize that it's the subtlety that often is going to have an impact. Like you can have one risk event, but maybe that risk event can impact a hundred different tasks all at the same time, or perhaps all independently. If they are all independent, you don't want to have to write that down a hundred times. You want to put the information in once and then say, or oh, apply it to all these tasks, but allow them to be independent of each other. Um, if you're into, into other, or you tried other risk analysis offer, uh, Primavera risk analysis um, is one of the, the, the main uh, players in the market. Well, uh, cost um, is, you can see, for example, if you want to use the basic version of uh, tomorrow, it's cost is zero. But even if you get the, the full-on version, it's still going to cost you um, much less than and nearly all the competitors, I think. Okay. Right. Um, so we've got two editions. Um, probably many of you have downloaded the uh, the uh, basic edition. Basic edition, there are a number of different things. These are all related to um, describing risk that are not in uh, the basic edition. But the work amount uncertainty is in, in the, the basic edition. And there's a great deal that you can do with that. So um, we, we hope that if you like it, you find it works, you find it fast, you like the reporting and all the capabilities, that maybe you always think, you know, it might be worth us investing in um, having all of these other capabilities as well. If you're just running a, uh, a, a course, for example, you can, in, in tomorrow, you can switch a little button on and that will switch uh, tomorrow from a basic edition to a complete edition and it will last a, a, a couple of weeks. It's actually, uh, the, it lasts depend on how many times you use it. If you use it 10 times a day, it won't last very long. If you use it a few times, it will last quite a while. So you always have an opportunity to try out the complete version, see if it's worth your while. And if it is, then please feel free to give us your money. All right. <laughs> Stain's looking again now. <laughs> we'll cut that out of the webinar. Yeah. Recording, yeah? OK, yeah. All right, so let's go into, um, let's go into the schedule. And let's see if I can show you the model. Uh, Right, this is uh, a, an example model that you can find shipped with Tamara. It's got a lot of stuff all pre-built in here. Um, so uh, to start with, you can do file import schedule. You can select a schedule from a file from a Primavera P6 database and, and you can import. Once you've imported it, if one, you can start to add uncertainty and risk. When you're finished, um, you save it as a Tamara file and then next time that you say, oh, the, the main schedule has changed, you can just click on the update. You go to the same uh, menu. You pick the file that you're going to update from, and it will show you the latest. You will update for the latest version. So by that, it will update any tasks, that, uh, new tasks that have been added, any changes, any logic. Um, it will update uh, the percentage is complete, any changes you put in the baseline values for the durations and for uh, for cost. So if I start um, with this menu, you can see that in the project overview, we've got, uh, this is where we put all the information in. We have the main menu here, which is where you've got a, a table view of all of the tasks that have been imported, the uh, most likely durations, that were calculated or input from the main schedule, the working hours um, according to, <coughs> excuse me, according to the calendars that it's imported, and it's estimated start and finish date. Um, 
then we've got on to the right so you can probably see this is a little bit gray on the left to the right is where we add the information i'm just going to point out on the far right we have a little tick for sid output when you tick this box um, because it's the only time that I'm going to be looking at this. When you tick these boxes, these will be things that will be output um, for use in a model risk model, um, which I will dis display in the next webinar. All right, so we've got um, the first thing we've got work amount uncertainty. So this is really the, 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 the uncertainty in the scope. And we, are, we can assign uh, different levels of uncertainty. So we've got these different definitions, um, and those definitions will be will, will vary depending on on the particular type of work that you're doing. Like for example, a conservative but small amount of uncertainty might be, as it is in this case, minus 10%, um, minus 2%, and plus 1%. Three point estimate. So small amount of uncertainty says it could be the work could be about 1% bigger. It could be 10% smaller. Most likely it's 2% smaller because the, the estimate's a bit conservative. They've overestimated a bit. All right, so where do these definitions come from? They come from up here, the cost uncertainty definitions. Sorry, they don't come from there at all. They come from here, the work, work amount uncertainty definitions. And here you can edit them and save them. So you can apply it, for example, if you're in IT, you might have a lot more uncertainty that you want to define for these different uh, categories. Um, but you can you can edit them as you wish, save, and then you've got uh, um, some definitions that make it easier for you. So I can make minus six percent, for example, here. I might just save that. Yes. All right. So once we've got this um, this work amount uh, uncertainty, which we can assign from any one of these numbers, you see that that's changed by 6% now. We can also say, well, you know, this task isn't really one of those. Uh, I want to assign some custom uncertainty. So you, with custom uncertainty, you can do either a percentage from the base, so you can say minus 10%, plus 20%, or you can say absolute number of days. So you can say three, five, 20, something like that. And that's what's been done here and here in a bunch of different places. Um, we've got the expenses. These all been imported in from the schedule. Um, if you go and, and raise up this little uh, window here, you can see a number of uh, different pieces of information. This is something perhaps you wouldn't have seen if you uh, if you already been playing with with Tamara. It's not uh, particularly obvious, but we can start. You can go around and sort of look here. You've got unplanned work. You can see for this task there was an unplanned work risk. Um, with a probability of 0.3, and it's included in the, the risk assessment, for example. All right, so we have the... Okay, uh, so it, we've got 10 minutes late uh, to go. Um, please send, if you want to just um, type in your questions, or, or you can send them to Stain, um, who has sent you emails for this webinar. You can, you can send them to this, and we can't answer them now we'll answer them um, after, the, after the webinar. All right, I want to talk about some of the others. We've got um, resource cost uncertainty. So um, you've got a number of different resources, which again are imported from the schedule. And you can assign, if you wish, you can assign uncertainty like this to any of these different resource costs. And then that will be pushed through the model. You can also assign uncertainty on standby cost. So um, you might have a fixed price, for uh, standby, look, for example, if there or there's uh, been uh, a complete shutdown of site, and you might want to be want to put some different uncertainties in there. Uh, so you can have expense amount uncertainty. Um, you can have uh, uh, a uh, re resource cost uncertainty. It's a definition. Sorry, I feel like I'm just been there. Oh, <laughs> say that again. We can have expense amount uncertainty here, which has the same sort of definitions. Um, we can put in task-specific risks. So to put in a task-specific risk on any individual task, we need to go into the task-specific risk, and you'll see a list. There are two different types. There's local risks, 
and there are ones from Pelican. So these are ones that have been imported in, in from Pelican. They can be updated. You click the bottom, um, it will update for latest information. Um, if you click on import, you can import new risks um, that come from the Pelican database. So, and you've got include and you've got independent. Independent means that if I apply that risk to several different tasks, it can occur independently from one to another. It might happen with one, it might not happen with another. If I don't have it on, it will happen to all tasks at the same time or not at the same time. Um, the, the local risks have a, a much larger um, information data set because the Pelican risk have already got all this information built in. The Pelican risk will use the quantitative information that are stored in Pelican. So if you're in local risks, you can put in uh, the frequency, you can edit these, you can put in whether these tasks are independent, like I said, uh, whether they're a single event. So if they're a single event, for example, that's uh, it's something that could happen with only 10% chance. If it's uh, something that can happen multiple times, then you can, uh, you can have an expected frequency of say 10 uh, over the life of the project. Uh, if I click on, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't be able to click on the single event here because it's bigger than 10. But if, if because it's single event switched off, on average, this will happen 10 times during the project. And when, and when it does happen, it will have a delay of one to five days, and some of them will have costs and some of them will not. So you can have it that is, it, the risk only has an impact of cost or only has an impact of delay, or it can have both. Okay, so um, how do you add a task-specific risk? You simply go in here, you select um, for that particular task, you select it, and I'll have those two, thank you very much, go okay and they, they will appear in that, in, that, uh, in that column. And of course, you can have several different um, uh, risk events, all, all that might occur at the same time. We have an unplanned risk, event, unplanned risk work. Um, unplanned risk is, what we do here is we build in a risk event. So the building permit is refused. If the building permit is refused, what then? Well, you can see this is driven by the building permit being refused. So if the building permit is refused, that duration, which was zero in the base schedule, will now have a minimum, most likely a maximum of four, five, eight days. And similarly over here, this will have a min most maximum, or min most likely max of three, four, seven. These will both switch on at the same time if this risk event is simulated to occur. So when that simulates with a 30% chance of occurring, they will both take longer, that will affect the schedule. Okay, so um, if you uh, uh, want to get in interested into how uh, Tamara does all these risk modeling, you can find all of this very well described uh, in the help file. We try to do our best to make the help file uh, visually interesting and useful, and there are a number of different examples that you will find um, that uh, come with Tamara that explain all, all, of, all of those uh, examples in the schedule, in the, in the help file. So I want to just quickly show you the Gantt chart. The Gantt chart is simply um, the same representation that you're, you're normally used to, and it shows you the different tasks and you can expand and, and contract, etc. cetera. Uh, we've got the simulation settings. This is about how far or how much, uh, how many samples you're going to do in the model whether you wish to calculate costs, um, the unit uh, of currency, the format if you are calculating cost, the seed value, very useful if you want to be able to rerun and reproduce exactly the same simulation results. Um, then we don't have a simulation button. It's a little arrogant perhaps, but we, we think, well, why bother? Because when I click it, um, it's done. It only took 1.3 seconds to run 10,000 samples on that schedule. And when it's finished, you'll see the little uh, progress bar was sitting on the very bottom left-hand corner of my window. When it's finished, you're seeing a number of different results five minutes ago. So here we have a histogram of, in this case, the commercial construction example, the head, which is the whole project, the whole, we're looking at the finish date. And you can see we've got weekends in here. You can look at the duration in terms of total number of days. Um, you can look at the total cost. You can look at these in histogram, or you can look at them in cumulative versions. So we can look at the duration and 
finished state in cumulative. We can look at cumulative descending. We can look at preto. Here we've got preto, which is a combination of the histogram and the cumulative. A tornado chart, which is very interesting. Tornado chart tells us what is driving the uncertainty, in this case, of the finished state of my project. But I can look at just maybe the electrical. What is driving uncertainty in the electrical section of the project uh, or in the carpentry work? So not much going on in the carpentry work, in the masonry. So you can look at the uh, part of the project or the whole project. Um, you can, and so this tells us that the uncertainty in the foundations is in terms of task duration is what's really driving it. But I can also look at task specific risks. I can add them to the tornado. And I find that found, finding archeologicals uh, and archeological remains, this is going to strongly drive the uncertainty. So perhaps we should be doing a little survey ourselves uh, in advance. Perhaps we should be figuring out what the foundation's um, uh, uncertainty really is and, and try to be a little bit more precise about how long it's really going to take. We can put in unplanned work um, if there's, the unplanned work is having any effect. Uh, we can put in risk factors. So risk factors are things like labor, uh, poor site management, design, the steel skill. Um, are these having any significant impact? And I think it's very interesting to be able to make that combined analysis. And you can set this up to give you um, tornadoes at different levels by, by these different controls, how many uh, things you want to include. You can also, um, if you, you can also look at a trend plot. A uh, trend plot is looking at the cash flow that can come out of your uh, out of your uh, project, where you spend the money. You can look at it periodic, you can look at cumulative, scatter plot, which is you can have with the trend line or not. So you would scatter plot. You can see finish date and how much you're expecting to spend, and you can see where you where you are, and you can ask yourself, how what's the chances of sitting line within that target? <clears throat> 